this video is going to cover hierarchical and bifactor models. So this is in the Chi uh, Klein chapter 9 and the Bojan chapter 9 where it talks about structured order models um, instead of just one set of CFA latents. Um, so to kind of the kind of the naming of these things, a hierarchical model has a rank or an order to it and sometimes those are called higher order models. So higher order models are when latent variables uh, influence other latent variables in a very structured way. Um, these are supposed to be separate from fully latent models, which we'll cover in the next section. Uh, but it's basically like, I think there is IQ, and then there's verbal, and um, what's the other one? Uh, fluid, whatever, and then those are measured, and so these are kind of like step one, step two, to step three, sort of. Um, so latents influence other latents, and you're trying to describe the correlations between latents. Whereas a bifactor model, to me, this is one of the most interesting areas to kind of work in now because of the conceptual orientation you could take with these. And those are generally CFAs with two sets of latents, um, two distinct sets, not two latents, um, that are not hierarchical. And these models are often considered, if I first control for X, what's left over? So this really gets into this idea of generalized relationships and domain-specific relationships. So to me, they're really neat. Um, so with a higher order model, you have some latent variables that are measured by your manifest or your observed variables. And that's your first order CFA. So first order meaning the first layer of latents. But then what you do is take the relationship between the latents, so those curved or double-headed arrows, and you explain that relationship by adding a second set of latent variables that predicts those first order latents. So you tend to get what's called a second order model, um, where you're explaining the relationship between first order latents by having those second order latents there. So basically, in essence, what happens is we're switching out the covariance between factors and using directional arrows. So this is more of a theory-based approach to me because mathematically, uh, those models fit the same. So if you use covariances versus uh, directional arrows, you're going to get the same model fit because it's still estimating the same variance. Uh, so this is more of a theoretical description of fit rather than uh, as a second order model, rather than um, just a first order with covariances. So when are these things used? It's like I said, usually a theory-based approach. There are multiple latent variables that cover, co-vary with each other, but they co-vary a lot. So this is especially useful if you have very highly correlated first order latents. Um, and you're explaining that the correlation between them, the reason it's so high, but maybe you don't want to combine them, is because you have this idea of a second order latent. So I don't want to combine um, all these different measures of IQ. They are separate things. Now they're highly correlated because of this IQ structure. All right, so here's an example. So this here is the first order latents. So this is just an example I pulled off the internet. I don't totally remember what it stands for. Um, and so those first order latents are just your normal CFA measurement model here on the left side. And they're very highly correlated between each other. And so that kind of correlation, especially this one, usually indicates that you should collapse variables. Um, but I could also build this model here with this second order latent. So you see how it's hierarchical because it's nested within each other or stepped. Um, and so it's saying that there uh, is a lot of their covariance here and that's explained by this overall variable. And so I'm, I'm talking about structure of the data as my theory based point. Uh, click, click, there we go. So the covariance of that first order uh, is accounted for by adding that second order plus what's considered a specific factor. So if I back up here, each one of these bubbles before just had covariance. Now it's gonna have a covariance and an error term 
because it um, it has it's um, sorry uh, endogenous at this point because there are arrows coming into it before it was only exogenous with arrows going out and so these three have to have error terms as well before we estimated their variance and then the covariance now we're estimating their error which um, is considered a specific factor or the error associated with that particular latent okay. and that's the variance that's not accounted for by adding the second structured order of latents but generally to me this is a very theory based approach where the higher order is indirectly influencing the manifest variables through those first order so this supplier cooperation whatever it is indirectly influences the answers here through these other latent variables so i think there's this overall factor and within that overall factor i can break it down into three subdomains so we tend to think about uh, scales a lot this way, where scales have a total score, but then they also have little uh, individual subscales. This is a, a way to think about those subscales being subsumed by the total score. Now what I'm going to do is compare that with a bifactor model after I talk about identification, and bifactor models have a different approach. So each portion of the model has to be identified. So you've got the lower level um, CFA portion, and that's generally done. We've been setting marker variables. So we'd have a little one here on these. Um, the section, the higher order section also has to be identified. So I will have to um, do something to make sure that piece is identified. And Levi mostly takes care of that for you. So some, some different ways that you can do that is some of the loadings in the upper portion are going to be set to equal. We can set the variance on the upper latent to one so we can actually standardize the latent variable in the upper section. Or we can set some of the error variances on the first order model to be equal. I think the general rule is the second one is that we tend to standardize on the latent variable so that um, we can account for the uh, covariances between first order latents and their error terms by sort of constraining, saying this variance at the highest level is sort of constrained to, to one. That just sets it to a scale, remember, and it, um, it allows it to say, well, this is the 100% of the variance and then splitting it up between the um, prediction arrows and the error terms for that second order, the first order piece. So essentially we would set the variance of this bubble to one and that would constrain how much of that variance, how, where things can go down here. Um, and so we could standardize on the latent variable and I do feel like that is a little more common for uh, identification at the top. Okay. Um, if you set it to a marker variable, sorry to keep backing up, it will actually kick, uh, set one of these to one. That's also pretty common. So those are the same ways that we've been doing, actually. And these are other ways that we could do it uh, as well. All right, so let me compare this idea of a structured model to a bifactor model. Okay. Now, bifactor models, I think this is actually a, a um, IQ example. Bifactor models are this idea that there is a global um, domain or generalized factor and then there are extra little subcomponents after you account for it. So the way I think about bifactor models is sort of like a control variable almost, where this generalized domain, generalized thing over here, we account for all the variance for that. So I expect all of these paths to be significant. Um, it does not run them sequentially, like maybe a hierarchical or regression, but we would expect that controlling for the, the generalized factor, so all of these need to be significant, what is left over at the domain specific level, and so here I have verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal. One thing to notice here is that these are not co-varied on purpose. So let's look at some words here. So a bifactor model is a, set, a special type of model with two sets of latents. So this is not two bubbles, this is two sets, distinct sides, um, but they're not hierarchically structured. In fact, each 
manifest variable here has two arrows coming into it. So it's almost like cross-listing. It's like having a, in, a, in this example, fourth factor that every item should load on. You can also do these as EFAs, um, by factor EFAs sometimes are called Schmid Lyman's, but the idea is it would first um, take out all the variance due to uh, a generalized factor and then see what's left over. So they're best used when you have a general factor that accounts for the variance in the manifest variable. So you really do want it to be significant all on the generalized side. And then after controlling for that, what happens in these domain specific areas that influence those manifest variables? Um, so I'll give you another example of something we're kind of working on in our lab is we have this idea, um, a friend that I work with does a lot of work on meaning in life. And one thing he's noticed is that it's called meaning in life, it's called hardiness, resiliency, purpose. So it has a lot of different names. And the question in their lab really became, are they really different things? Are we all testing the same general idea of meaning, purposefulness? Uh, we're just calling it different things so people will publish in different areas. And so what we can do and what we've tried on a couple of scales is look at what happens if I take an overall variable that one of my friends jokingly called Merpus <laughs> uh, and account for that, then what's left over? So is it that we have every, yes, it's all meaning, but then after that, there's a little bit of this research that supports separating out maybe resiliency or uh, hardiness. So what questions are, or what was left over after we count for Merpus? And uh, stay tuned, because we're still working on it, but that's the idea, is that after accounting for all of this other, all this big common variance, what domain specific areas are left? So one thing to note when you build these models, and this is something we'll have to do very specifically in Levon, is um, we uncorrelate the latent variables on all these because the domain specific idea is that they are specific so they aren't correlated because if they were correlated it should count on the generalized side. So this is a special type of model where we uncorrelate the, co um, the latent variables, the uh, exogenous latent variables, and you'll have to remember that Levon naturally forces those correlations like we saw in the path videos so we're gonna have to make sure we turn those off. So really the difference between them, in a hierarchical model, a second order of latents is added to influence the first order. It could be um, three or four sets of latents. You can go third, fourth, fifth order. It would be a little nuts, but you could. Um, while in a bifactor model, those two sets of latents are uncorrelated. So there's no structure involved. And so what does that really allow me to test? Um, and those are just the theoretical differences that we're comparing here. So in a, in a hierarchical model, it really allows me to see how those first order latents influenced, um, I'm sorry, this is for, for bifactor models, uh, to back up a second. So what does that allow me to test differently? Sorry, wrong side. Um, in a hierarchical model, what I'm getting to test is the structure of this influences this, which then influences that. So it's kind of an A to B to C. Whereas in a bifactor, it's like, if I control for this, what's left? So a lot of times the variance is actually being accounted for in similar-ish ways, minus that correlation thing. Um, but it's definitely a theoretical explanation difference between the two. And then now the advantages of a bifactor model is it allows me to see how those first order latents, those, those specific domain specific areas influence my manifest variable separately from these other latents. Okay. And so after accounting for that generalized latent variable, what domain specific items still work? So it might be that these, I, these items that you expect to account for stress really are just normal psychological whatever and it um, it doesn't account for anything so it's all part of that generalized domain and does nothing for you in the in the um, specific areas okay. 
So you could build a model that included just the generalized factor and one domain to see if that's better than a model that includes all three, um, going back to this specific example. But this allows really for model comparisons of what fits better, including these multiple extra specific domains or not. Um, and so it really, to me, allows you to test if they even exist, are they even there, uh, after accounting for sort of a generalized idea. Okay. It also helps explain a lot of the covariance between items because they're all related to one other thing. Um, and then separately, here's how they fit um, after accounting for the, the generalized one. So that's the basic gist of hierarchical and bifactor models. So you should go watch the video covering the example that walks through both of these types of models to really make sure you understand how to program them. Um, otherwise, they're very similar to first order models. We're just adding one extra little component.